thank you so much, Dee, not only for this, but for the entire series and all the staff. Mm -hmm. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome as we close out this series of Marxist classes with a subject that brings everything together, the role of the Communist Party Club. As we grow in new areas of the country, it's likely some of you on this webinar may not yet be in a club. <clears throat> Probably most of us do have experiences with club life, and we have a meaningful exchange during this session. <clears throat> the presentation will be given straight through followed by an art show, <clears throat> and then the webinar will open for question and discussion. New slide. Uh, new slide, Lisa. Okay, thank you. My name is Joelle Fishman. <clears throat> I serve as chair of the Communist Party of Connecticut, um, where we've emphasized and experimented over a number of decades with building clubs rooted in defined multiracial working class neighborhoods and workplaces, utilizing the people's world as the prime organizing tool. So I'm excited to share this presentation with comrade Jamal Henderson. And Jamal, do you wanna introduce yourself? Yes, thank you, Joel. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jamal Henderson. I am an organizer with the Connecticut Communist Party here in New Haven. And I am also a proud member of the New Hallville Winchester Communist Club here in New Haven. And I am also a 20 year food service worker at Southern Connecticut State University. And I am also a union steward at Southern Connecticut State University. Thank you for having me. Beautiful. Thank you, Jamal. <clears throat> so, in order to dig in, we have to place the context. And wonderful, what a wonderful class that we are. Uh, coming after on the party program by Joe Sims. This series began by defining our strategy and tactics in today's circumstances. <clears throat> As the vicious fascist threat to all our rights and the planet intensifies and people are struggling as billionaires seize ever more wealth, a powerful fight back of rising democratic movements and courageous multiracial working class organizing is underway. And we are very much a part of that as the photos show. Our party is a beacon for those searching for a decent life and hope for the future. What we do matters and what we do can make a difference and win victories both short term and long term. How do we as a communist party best contribute to build the strongest united front possible coming up on 2024 and beyond, while at the same time building our strength and socialist vision. New slide. The answer lies in our club structure. Now more than ever, rooting our party in the working class the multiracial, multinational, multigender and generational working class in communities and workplaces and campuses is key. During last week's class on collectivity and democratic centralism, Joe Sims laid out how Lenin and the Bolsheviks grounded the revolutionary movement in clubs. Throughout our history, the Communist Party USA has made great contributions to working class and democratic struggles based on industrial concentration and the work of clubs. We can learn a lot from this history. We can draw on it as we rebuild in today's conditions. New slide. One of my favorite stories is from Hosey Hudson's book, Black Worker in the Deep South. It's a good read. I encourage everyone to do it. He describes his first club meeting in Birmingham. <coughs> where he was a foundry worker in the 1930s. The exploitation and racism were raw. It tells a lot about industrial concentration and club building. I've selected a few passages, passages from chapter five. When I got to Lee's house, I expected to see a crowded room, but was shocked to see only those I had been seeing every day in the shop or around the community. And there were about eight altogether. What kind of meeting was this? Al Murphy began talking about the Scottsboro case, especially what it meant to the freedom struggle of the black people. 
It's the system itself that brings about these frame-ups and lynchings. He went on to say he wanted all of us to understand the kind of society in which we live robbed the masses of people of a livelihood, that the only way the bosses could prevent the white and the black masses of people from struggling together was to keep them divided. I said to myself, this man is a communist. I was at a communist meeting and though nothing sensational was happening, the idea was exciting. Al Murphy went on to say communists spread the party's message by distributing its leaflets and its newspaper. He said they would hold regular meetings, uh, get to them on time and pay dues regularly. We all eight signed up paying 50 cents initiation fee. We all agreed our main task would be among the workers in our shop, end quote. Posey Hudson became a revered leader in the foundry for workers' rights, and then in the community among the unemployed and for voting rights. He was such an outstanding organizer who brought many co-workers and community members into clubs and the party. Eventually, the bosses and racists ran him out of town. <clears throat> but years later, the great Jose Hudson <clears throat> was called back by the first black mayor in 1980 to receive a key to the city of Birmingham, Alabama. <clears throat> that June, at a meeting of the National Committee, <clears throat> Henry Winston congratulated Hosey Hudson for organizing steel workers <clears throat> and the democratic movement in Alabama. Winston said, <clears throat> how to fight and accomplish the great aim of all democratic forces in Alabama was inconceivable without the building of the Communist Party. Hosey, the communist, helped to build a strong Communist Party. <clears throat> Just think about it, he said. Only yesterday there was Bull Connor, the electric pods, the jailings, the dogs. But today, at this moment, Hosey is here with us, wearing a key to the city around his neck, a key given to him by the mayor of Birmingham. This slide. I had the honor and privilege to be trained by Henry Winston in the 1970s. Winston, as national chair, <clears throat> Gus Hall, as general secretary, led our party in rebuilding from the McCarthy period of persecution. I took the train to New York twice a month to be part of a group of nearby district organizers that met with Henry Winston and learned to turn the policies of our party into action. We learned that the club is the heart of the party, that the club must be rooted in shops and neighborhoods and campuses to build a united front and to bring workers into the Communist Party. Henry Winston said, quote, in life, democratic centralism means thriving shop and neighborhood clubs. The experience from below assisting in developing a national policy that puts into action throws the party in YCL among the working class and enables struggles to be won, end quote. New slide. In 1981, our party held an extraordinary conference in Milwaukee, where we charted the course for industrial concentration, focusing on the key sections of workers who, if they move forward, all will be moved forward with them. This was before deindustrialization, and the national focus was on steel, auto, longshore, among others. But the focus was not limited to the national concentrations. In every state and every city, there was concentration on the key group of workers there. That was where we strategically built grassroots clubs. In the Haven, my mentor Sid Taylor pulled together several members of the committee to free Angela Davis, who worked at the largest factory in town and we formed the Winchester Club. It's a long history, including organizing big labor community coalitions during a couple big strikes, stalling the company from closing down for several years while comrade Craig Gautier was union president in the 1990s. But the lesson for today, I believe, is that the use of the people's world as a primary tool for organizing enabled us to develop relationships with the largely black workforce, recruit into the party, and then when the company did finally move the plant to Belgium, we were in position to pivot and become a club in the neighborhood surrounding the shop. 
and Jamal Henderson chairs that club today, and he's going to speak about that shortly. Our Centennial National Convention in 2019 unanimously passed Resolution 25, reaffirming the commitment to grassroots neighborhood and workplace clubs and the districts to sustain them. If you look online, it's called Building Clubs and Districts for Sustainable Growth. New slide. Why is the club the heart of the party? Well, it's where we learn from the working class and people, where we struggle together on survival needs like housing and healthcare and jobs and violence, LGBTQ rights, and voting rights, where we bring our program, our strategy and tactics, our internationalism, working class internationalism, our socialist vision, and help engage people in the struggle who otherwise might never have done so. The club is where we grow on the ground. And why is the people's world a critical organizing and education tool? Because it provides the content and the reason to visit the same family each week and have a conversation, develop relationships, register new voters, offer invites to get engaged in the community or at their workplace or in, uh, in the club. So when we launched this method of work in Hartford with the leadership of Brian Steinberg, and then all over Connecticut after the Milwaukee conference, the composition of our party changed dramatically. Our ability to organize and be in coalition and affect voter turnout increased dramatically as well. Today, our award-winning People's World is daily online. So how can electronic circulation be carried out effectively in the club concentration area? What printouts can be used regularly? One terrific option that we use is the weekly newsletter size PDF that People's World provides each week, which can easily be printed and given hand to hand. Next slide. The bottom line, the bottom line right now is 2024. The fascist cabal has their sights set on the elections. There's going to be confusion and division created. The need is for unity on the issues, while also challenging policies where we disagree with candidates. The deciding factor will be convincing voters that collectively their vote can make a difference. A club on the ground, talking to people year round, can make a big contribution to voter clarity, to turnout and election results. And there's the possibility of running our own candidate as well. Just as communists in Birmingham built the democratic movement, won victories, and built the party through industrial concentration clubs, right now we have the same task of concentrating on key precincts and wards door to door to reject racism and bigotry and the threat of fascist rule. New slide. We can play a big part if we act collectively and strategically to build clubs in key communities and key shops of this day, including steel and auto, but also Amazon and Starbucks and UPS and healthcare and public education and so many more. These key workers will be found in the neighborhoods on people's world routes, on strike picket lines or other ways to develop regular contact, ongoing relationships and new members. Like Hosey Hudson, their lives can be transformed, and as communists, they can play a role to help transform society. <laughs> New slide. To summarize, the club is the heart of the party. It tests our strategy and tactics and brings them to life. The club is our party's living connection to the multiracial working class and people. Having a grassroots base makes our coalition building and united front stronger with unions, community groups, women, LGBTQ, environment, youth, churches, social clubs, organizations like Poor People's Campaign, civil rights, civil liberties, and peace organizations. New slide. A strategic approach should be taken to choosing a club concentration. The district establishes clubs, or if there's no district, the national organization plays that role 
led by Rosanna Cambrone. What neighborhood, what workplace to build a club? Learn the needs and conditions of organizations and voting patterns. Even where there are just a few scattered members who joined online or otherwise, this methodology lays the groundwork. Even if the club area needs to be larger at first, a strategic concentration area can be selected and a modest work plan to consider. Using the people's world as an organizing tool takes revolutionary patience. It's not overnight and it takes consistency over time. It offers the chance to develop relationships and raise consciousness, working class consciousness, bring in new members and strengthen our working class racial and gender composition in our clubs. Concentration work opens the door to the kind of organizing some clubs around the country are leading like intervening to stop evictions or deportations or police brutality or organizing a union or strike solidarity with the possibility of local wins that build working class power. New slide. A communist club of action makes a difference in its neighborhood, in its area of concentration. A neighborhood club is in position to serve as a shop steward for the community's needs and rights. Our party clubs can bring a sense of hope and community. They're looked to for their opinions, tactics, and leadership. For the club to play its role, it takes a collective approach and method of work, deciding on what and how and carrying that out together. Our clubs make a difference in our own lives as well, with the comradeship, looking out for each other, and political education and solidarity with workers of the world. As Joe Sims said, all for one and one for all. In People's World and at CPUSA.org, I found a lot of wonderful stories about clubs in action on all fronts across the country, and it'll be exciting to hear from them today if you if you like to share later on. So now, uh, Jamal Henderson is prepared to share his club experience and a show of his wonderful artwork. And after that completes, we're going to open the webinar for dialogue. Jamal, the floor is yours. Thank you, Joel. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. Um, the New Hallville Winchester Club, my club, is located in a largely African-American working class neighborhood here in New Haven, Connecticut where we focus on Ward 20. Our club thrives on forming a strong united front and infrastructure on the ground to support and be in solidarity with our local labor residents, community, organizations, elected allies, and labor community coalitions. Also, consistently being involved on the front line in the neighborhood, battling the key issues my neighborhood faces, more affordable housing opportunities, economic development, urban gardens, gun prevention, intervention programs, and jobs for our youth. There are an increasing number of residents on our weekly Connecticut People's World Route. We use tools like our Know Your Rights Utility, Food Pantry, Rent Mortgage, Resource Flyer, or our Tax the Rich petition. We just had a lot of success on the doors, getting a lot of signatures. We also have our newly launched Housing as a Human Rights pamphlet, which is a 10-point program, which addresses the issues of housing crisis today and exposes how the for-profit housing systems cannot provide for people's needs. The People's World Newsletter let us have meaningful conversations. It allows us to hear what's on people's minds, while at the same time showcasing a prominent historical role the Communist Party New Hallville Club plays in the development of the New Hallville neighborhood. After years of marches and petitions, the club initiated an abandoned building formerly used by the Connecticut Department of Social Services, which is now being renovated by the city for adult education, with a space for other activities and community access. Now we are strategizing all clubs in New Haven how to bring this to the next level and restart our Jobs for Youth, Jobs for All campaign. 
The elected co-chairs in our ward are both communists and have gone in our ward has gone from one of the lowest to one of the highest voter turnout wards in the city of New Haven. My personal experiences with the club and party honestly has helped me grow as a better person. It has, it has helped me become a better organizer and the club's collective bond, each member's passion and justice it also inspires me to be constantly involved in the club's development, the recruitment process and success within my community. Who would ever thought I would find like-minded people, individuals in my backyard that has the same passion and change for justice? It's amazing. The club has also taught me the ideals and principle of communism in the process on the journey. While being a great place for me to grow and learn, my club members are my family, sharing their experiences and knowledge with me while pushing me every day. We push each other to be better and bigger and to make a difference in the community. While fellowshipping together at community events or brainstorming strategic ideals for the club to be more involved and engaged. My club is also a historical club, like Joel mentioned, which was founded during the campaign to free Angela Davis, which gives me more motivation to keep standing up for everything my past comrades stood for, built and fought against in the city of New Haven's history. Also, the contact and conversations with comrades no longer able to be as active gives me more reassurance that I'm doing the right thing as a person. But overall, I'm grateful. I'm honestly grateful to be among a group of comrades that helped me hone my skill set. We all play special roles in the club's dynamics, and we all bring something unique to the table, which makes it an honor for me to be proud to say that I am part of the New Hallville Winchester Communist Club. Thank you. So beautiful, Jamal. And now um, we're going to have a big treat. Culture is an important part of our movement. Jamal is a wonderful artist, and he is going to present some portraits um, that he has uh, prepared. Thank you, thank you, Joel. Um, yes, I'm passionate about art, and um, you know, art is just a therapeutic way for me to express myself. So this series right here is titled "Revolutionary," um, just an ode and an honor to uh, give back to uh, our, our revolutionary leaders in the social justice movement. So my first um, piece right here is, is a piece of Claudia Jones. Um, she was a communist, a political activist, a feminist, a black activist. Um, you know, she she was knee deep in the party, um, in the growth of the party, and um, we celebrate her through my art right here. Next photo, please. This photo right here I draw was a. a Oh, to Angela Davis. Um, we all know who is an American Marxist, a philosopher, an author, a feminist, um, political activist, um, highly in the in the role of social social justice. So this is kind of a Mona Lisa, um, Angela Davis mashup right here. If you if you understand where I was trying to get at. Thank you. The next the next piece, please. This right here is Harriet Tubman, um, a piece I dedicate to Harriet Tubman, somebody that's real um, an idol in my life. Um, you know, she's an abolish, abolishness, um, social activist, um, played key roles in the uh, Underground Railroad movement, um, getting our peoples the freedom. And, um, you know, I just wanted to pay respects to Harriet Tubman for the things she did. So this is a piece dedicated to Harriet and the Underground Railroad. Thank you. The next. Oh yes, this right here is a piece I dedicated to Ida B. Wells. Um, you know, a journalist, an educator, um, co-founder of the uh, National uh, Advancement for African American Color People, which is the NAACP, fought highly for women's rights. So, if you, as you see in the background, I implicated, um, you know, real photos from the the, the women's uh, equality marches in the past. Um, which I just stood up for. Thank you. This piece is um, dedicated to uh, Cesar Chavez, um, who was our le labor leader, um, civil rights activist, and who was a co-founder of the National Farm Workers Association, um, fighting for justice for the immigration 
communities out in California working in the, um, the field. So I wanted to pay homage to Caesar and everything he stood for for the immigration community. Here um, is a piece I dedicate to Coretta Scott King, um, somebody who, who was also dear to my heart, along with her husband, Martin Luther King. So it's kind of a mashup of both of them. And um, yeah, she was an advocate for American equality, African-American equality, um, a civil rights leader, like I said, Martin Luther King's wife um, definitely kept him grounded in the movement for civil rights and also was an author and an activist. So I wanted to pay my respects to uh, Coretta. Here um, is Joan Bez, um, a folk singer, activist. Um, she's still alive. Um, you know, singer, songwriter. Um, she performs many songs of social justice, freedom, um, over 60 songs. If you haven't heard about her, once again, Joan Bez, um, you can check her out online, YouTube. But uh, social justice icon, um, Wicked with the guitar. I love her music, so I want to pay respects to her in, in this form right here. Oh, right here, Vicki Garvin. Um, Vicki Garvin, again, um, she, she was a communist, um, lifelong activist, radical intellectual, political activist, once again, member of the party, prominent organizer in the Black left during the height of the McCarthyism period. Um, just overall, a, a, a iconic um, sister, man. You know, she did a lot for the movements. Um, Mar Malcolm X, you know, the civil rights movement. Um, her writing, her articulateness. Um, as you see, it's kind of the same format I use for Ida, Ida B. Wells, with the mashup of seeing different um, strikes, you know, in the African American um, community during the '50s and '60s which Vicki Garvin um, fought, fought tirelessly to see a uh, follow through. Yeah, thank you. Here, um, another comrade. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Marvel Cook. Um, my comrade, um, Lisa Armstrong, she, she hit me to Marvel. Um, we were having uh, Marxist classes at the People Center here in New Haven, Connecticut. And Marvel is a writer, a civil rights activist, first African-American to work at a prominent white-owned newspaper. And she was also a member of the Communist Party USA. And she also fought tirelessly for the rights of the working class African-American workers during the 50s and the 60s, um, housekeeping workers, uh, stuff as such in New York City. So I wanted to pay my respects to Marvel with the butterflies around her. Um, you know, just a sense of, 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 of you know, rebirth yeah, in that nature. Thank you. Um, and finally, 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 this is my comrade, my dear friend, um, the late Art Pearl. Um, Art is a man who dedicated his life to the working class people. Um, he dedicated his life to myself. Um, I owe a lot to, to Art. Um, I owe a lot to his wife, Joelle Fishman. Um, believing in me, giving me the opportunity to hone my skill set and to become the person that you see in front of you today on this webinar. Um, he was a founding member of Local 34 at Yale, and he was also a constant, constant voice in the Tax the Rich movement, but he was also a constant voice in the Communist Party um, movement nationally, internationally, and here locally in Connecticut. Um, once again, he was a dear friend um my mentor and whose legacy um i pride myself on on carrying forward um so yeah this is a piece dedicated to art thank you well thank you jamal so much for everything and by the way i want folks to know that that gorgeous piece of artwork that jamal spontaneously created mm -hmm. the week art died um the youth had a march, their annual African-American history march, and they dedicated it that, at that after he passed, they dedicated it to Art Perot, and they made that beautiful thing into a button. I don't know if you can see, but uh, we wear that all the time out here in, in Connecticut.
Um, and before, just as a transition, because I'm pretty overwhelmed, Jamal, by that wonderful presentation, I wondered if you could just spontaneously say a word about how you got into art, what it means to you. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Joelle. Um, art is, is something um, my late mother, you know, my mom, you know, was, was you know, something she would do on the side. Um, so, you know, my mom, you know, she, she left me at an early age. So when I went to live with my grandparents, which was my mom's parents, you know, they would see me doodling. They would just see me using art as a way of outlet, of a therapeutic outlet, if I make sense. So they, my grandparents, really honed that, um, that there, um, buying me color books, um, markers, pencils, pens, you name it. I had it all. And, um, and my grandfather, man, you know, God rest his soul, he worked at the Winchester Gun Factory uh, a major part of his life. And um, he would, you know, he would take time with me and uh, all of us. He had 10 children plus me, myself, and me, my brother, and my sister, which was 13, my, my mother's kids, you know. Um, he would just take time out with me. And he brought me down to Audubon Street here in New Haven to the Creative Arts Workshop. Um, and he enrolled me into the Creative Arts Workshop about 11, 12, 13, around 14, about four years I was there. And it was an amazing experience. Um, the teachers, the lectures, um, the benefits, it just brought in my mind. And once again, like I said in the beginning, art to me is, is, is therapeutic. It's something I use as an outlet and um, a way to express myself. So when it came down to making these pieces right here, you know, I'm, I'm passionate about change. I'm passionate about social justice and I'm passionate about the icons and the leaders that are still with us and those that are not with us. Um, so I just want to dedicate these pieces you see right here to those to those icons and those legends. But yeah, I owe a lot of the art to my grandparents um, for definitely taking time out with me. My mother who, who was an artist, a doodler, you know, she didn't take it seriously. So I'm living through that, you know, I'm living through that. So I'm living through my mom, I'm living through my grandparents and um, just expressing myself and, and, and talking through my art. So those are some some key points on how I, I definitely got into the art world. Thank you so much for sharing that, Jamal. And I just want to say that um, you make a huge contribution putting your artistic skills um, to the service of the Communist Party and the working class movement. So we, it's very appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, D. Miles and, and comrades, for allowing me to showcase my art. Thank you. So we're going to um, um, move back uh, to the um, uh, conversation more specifically uh, around the clubs, although anything that's happened here is open for comment and discussion. Um, we have a bit of time. And so um, I'd like to, um, uh, I'd like to open up the floor uh, for discussion. Uh, Luke, are, uh, are there any hands? Yeah, of course. Um, just click the raised hand icon if you have a question or comment. I will call your name and open your mic, at which point you will open the mic on your end and uh, I will tell you to speak. So I'm currently looking for raised hands. Uh, Molly, I'm going to open your mic. Uh, thank you both so much uh, for this presentation. Um, I wanted to ask about building the club that you did in the first club based on, on the fight for Angela Davis. And I think you mentioned another one that was um, based around a, a company that a lot of the workers were in a majority African-American neighborhood. Um, so my question is just kind of rooted in just how difficult that is and uh, wondering if you could give us a little bit more of a picture uh, of that. Um, here in Cleveland, um, we have such incredible poverty levels and racial disparity. Um, for example, 
our a recent study said that our working class is 66 percent functionally illiterate mm -hmm. um, which means that they're at or below a fourth grade reading level um, and then in some neighborhoods majority black neighborhoods you're talking like 95 percent um and we have a, a major one of the most biggest world-class hospitals um the cleveland clinic based here um, and yet our infant and maternal mortality rate is one of the highest in the nation. Um, and it's like three or four times higher for black women. So the, the levels of, of trauma and, and just, yeah, in a lack of access is high. So how, like, how do you confront that? Um, and, and specifically if you're coming from a place like, you know, as someone who, as a white person who who doesn't have that kind of level of um, uh, experience with oppression, um, how do you manage like the racial dynamic and the educational differences um, while distributing the people's world, for example, or inviting people into a into a club meeting? Thank you. Go ahead, Um. I think to answer your question is it's about it's about accountab accountability. Um, you know, we all you know my neighborhood is a, a largely African American neighborhood. Um, you know, we face a lot of inequalities and disparities here too in New Orleansville. Maybe maybe not on the magnitude of Cleveland, but there there are a lot of disparities and inequalities here in in New Haven, Connecticut, also. And then within my community, um, it's about accountability. Um, I don't really, I don't really see race as a factor in that picture. It's about really getting in the neighborhood, listening to the heartbeat of the neighborhood, and listening to the concerns of the community. Um, that's that's a major success here in New Haven, especially in the club that I that I am in in New Hallville. Um, that I mentioned earlier and Joel mentioned, which piggybacks off the labor aspect of the Winchester gun factory, which is not there no more. So once the factory left, you know, we have a neighborhood with no resources, you know, a neighborhood that had to rebuild itself. Um, and we played a major part in that rebuilding by being on the ground, by hitting the doors consistently, um, asking questions, finding out who was doing what in the neighborhood, which organizations are involved. And we've been using that word United Front, just building that infrastructure. So when you, you are in these neighborhoods, um, you know, you, you mentioned the illiterate and, and stuff of that nature. Um, I, just, I, 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 just, I just think that's irrelevant because you know, the, the heartbeat of, of the community is what, what is our concern, is our concern. So, I, I feel that my club, we just get in there and listen to the concerns of the community, work along with the community, work along with the allies in the community um, to make a major change. Joel, would you like to add anything? Thanks. Yeah, I'll, I will. Uh, I'll start from the historical part. Um, uh, Molly asked, uh, you know, from the, the uh, beginnings of the club, which I was part of. Um, uh, we had a strong committee to free Angela Davis here, just as there were all across the country. And um, as I say, three of the members of that committee <coughs> happened to work at Winchester mm -hmm. Repeating Arms, which is the factory we're talking about in the neighborhood that we're talking about. It's all, it's all the same thing. And um, at that point in time, uh, the union uh, was uh, was not very democratic, and for uh, young militant uh, black members, couldn't get called on in a union meeting. So I was assigned to that club because it was industrial concentration. If you're the party leader, then that's where you have to be doing your work. And uh, Sid Taylor was there, and what happened was the the uh, club had its roots, its beginning and learning um, Robert's Rules of Order. <laughs> and Robert's Rules of Order was studied. 
so that now when the three comrades went to the union meeting, they knew how to put a procedural point and so on and so forth and get recognized. And, you know, as time went on, the thing is, you know, the most important thing, are you doing the work? I think if you're doing the work, then you earn the respect. Mm -hmm. And that's really what it is. It's not a matter of coming in and telling people what they're already living. It's not a matter of telling people uh, what they should be thinking. It's a matter of participating in the activities. It's a matter of listening, as I keep saying, learning, and then moving forward together. So uh, that's how that's how I would uh, respond. Um, next, Luke. Yeah, looking for raised hands. Once again, just uh, click the icon showing the raised hand. If you have a question or comment you'd like to make, let's see here. Matthew, I am opening your mic now. Just open your mic on your end. There you go. Thank you. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for the presentation um, for both the earlier one and this one now. Uh, my question is I know you mentioned uh, that you're deeply involved in the, uh, in the housing issues around New Haven. Um, just to give you a little background, I, uh, I live near Augusta, Georgia, which is the largest urban area around here, about comparable size. So my question is, did you use rent strikes as part of your strategy? And if so, how successful was it? Um, well, thank you for the question. Uh, we, first of all, <coughs> we, we've been working in coalition. Um, one of the things that has been accomplished uh, here in New Haven is um, a um, an ordinance um, establishing the right to have a tenant union, mm -hmm. and um, we have a um, my mind is going blank, but we we want a state law that requires um, every city to have a um, an entity that deals with fair fair rent commissions. And uh, so in our city, uh, there was a coalition that uh, is trying to organize tenants into unions and then went to the city, went to the fair rent commission. We also have an affordable housing committee that the board of alders set up um, because we had a movement that elected some progressive alders like what's happening around the country in a number of places. And uh, we got that. So that's where we're at right now in New Haven. Um, statewide, uh, there was a big effort called Cap the Rent at the legislature to try and get a rent cap because um, people are being faced with, um, you know, a hundred percent increase in their rent, fifty percent increase in their rent. They're becoming homeless. It's it's horrible. And of, of course, it's all about the um, the corporate landlords uh, uh, getting their grab. So um, uh, there was many, many people organized for that. We participated in the hearings. It didn't make it so far, but it did open the door for some other things. Um, so to answer the question, um, just the simple question about rent strike, we haven't had that experience yet here in Connecticut. And the Communist Party uh, nationally, uh, is has issued a uh, housing program which can be found at cpusa.org. It's uh, in the process of being printed uh, that you can hand out. Uh, but also in Connecticut, we have a Connecticut uh, housing is a human right uh, program and pamphlet that looks at the situation from the specifics of uh, our state. I hope that helps. Thank you. All right, so I'm um, looking for more raised hands now. Um, Kazoo, I'm going to open your mic. Just open your mic on your end and you'll be able to speak. Kazoo, there you go. Oh, it was open. There you go. Okay, are. okay. Um, uh, regarding when I first joined the party and 1972 um i was uh 
married to Dennis Mora of the Fort Hood Three, which is uh, some uh, a part of history of the party that people should look up. Um, and at that time, they uh, there were two car factories, GM and Tarrytown. Uh, in, so in New Jersey and Tarrytown, and Ricky Eisenberg was working in New Jersey, and Dennis was working in uh, Tarrytown. Um, and of course, Dennis being Puerto Rican, they put him in the pit. But um, they were trying to organize against the contract that was coming up. And they were able to recruit Bob and another uh, person, Mike Scott, not Mike Scott, Bill Scott, who was a very progressive person in the area. And from there, they were able to organize a lot of men into an, a, what they call an ad hoc committee, working with the union by going to, going to meetings, but also meeting uh, as a party club and also just meeting with those men who were willing to fight against that union uh, at Tarrytown. They had a dance, very successful, uh, up in the Bronx. They, uh, Dennis had a hard time because even though people speak Spanish, there were different ways of saying certain words, but he, would ha he had to do translation. And some of these leaflets had to be done overnight. And um, they were able to vote no on the contract. It was against the union, what the union said they wanted, but politically through us, we, uh, the party, they were still not giving the Tarrytown, the auto worker, I mean, the auto uh, bosses were not uh, giving what workers needed. But his, so this chapter uh, were a, were able was able to vote no on the contract against the union. So um, that's a dynamic that sometimes we're going to come up against. As much as as important as it is to work in the union and. Uh, and that's part of what we do, either when we're sent into a place or working in a place, and there, uh, you become a shop steward or what have you, then you find out that that union chapter is not really getting you what you want. So you take a bunch of other people and comrades, and you meet and you have a ad hoc committee and that's something that hasn't been talked about for a while I, I mean within these discussions and i think it would be good if we could just find out how that works the transit mike scott and so a couple of other people were uh asked to go work in the transit and they had also had an ad. am yeah, i going to long? it's so important but if you could wrap it up it'd be helpful Okay, yes. So they also had an ad hoc committee um, and voted no against what the union contract was going to be, but also fighting within the union. So um, 
they were successful on one hand, but now that I'm speaking, I'm realizing that it would be good if we could understand why some of these ad hoc committees come about and how we would work within a union. Thank as you. Communists. Thank you for sharing that history. It's very appreciated. And one of the things that <clears throat> I would just comment is that <clears throat> because of all the work, and I'm thinking about George Myers, who headed our labor work for many years, and Tim Wheeler is just coming out with a book about him. Uh, because of the circumstances at that time, it required these kinds of committees. And because of that, we have a lot of unions that are extremely progressive, that are on the cutting edge of organizing the unorganized. Right now we have a huge strike going on here in Connecticut with 1199. Uh, the housing work that I was talking about in New Haven and the uh, aldermanic victories, that's all a product really of working with the Unite Here unions at Yale and they connect with the community. So you have to look and see what are the circumstances of the moment and where you are and then figure out how to connect and bring it one step further. Okay, um, next. All right, looking for raised hands. Um, Thomas, I'm opening your mic now. And if, uh, I'd just like to add that if students and uh, people commenting could uh, limit their comments and questions to a minute or two, it would be greatly appreciated. So Thomas, your mic is open. Hi, uh, can you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm a I'm a member of the Communist Party here in Connecticut, and I'm in Hartford, not New Haven. But we also operate under clubs, and I appreciate everything you two just said and do, and for Connecticut and for the whole party, and I really appreciate it. I thought maybe we could speak a minute about 2024 is right around the corner, and the role of the clubs. And I know last time it may be the same this time. We don't know yet. Could be Biden and. Uh, and what's his place, Trump? <laughs> so I just wonder what you talk a little bit about the role of the clubs and our, our efforts at voter registration and getting out the vote. And I know in Hartford how important that is for us. And I'm in a union club. So we work a lot within the context of unions and uh, in, in Connecticut and elsewhere, they are becoming more progressive. We, we now can say tax the rich with no problem. you know. And so there's been some great movement there. So thank you both and everybody for presentation here. And um, yeah, if you could speak to that voter registration and how important it is. And I know some of our members, to be honest with you, don't feel the election is that important. And I think we have to look at that. You know, we're one step away from fascism as far as I'm concerned. So thank you. Oh, thank you for that question, Tom. Um, to answer your question. Jamal and, and Joel, you might want to uh, respond and summarize at this time. Thank you. Sorry. She said respond and summarize. Why don't you respond briefly and I'll summarize. Okay, we'll, yeah, we'll divvy it up. <laughs> yeah, Tom, I'm responding. Thank you for that question, Tom, comrade. Um, the voting registration is very, very important on the ground. Um, from, from registering voters to finding out if you were registered, if you haven't registered, you know where your poll's at. Like you mentioned, the 2024 elections are very, very important coming up. So it's a strategy. We work closely with unions. We work closely with our management teams, um, our war co-chairs, um, heavily on the ground, getting the information out. Um, we mentioned that the, alongside our people's world route, we also have the comparison sheets, you know, which candidate is doing what, which candidate is on our side. We bring that information to the doors to get the community uh, engaged and involved and just get that information out. Um, but the voter registration is a key, key component of the club's dynamics. Um, we volunteer on, on election day, if it's a local elections, if it's older elections, um, if it's the presidential election, um, coming up next year, we're, we're highly involved on the ground, but, but it's, it's about educating the, um, residents. It's about educating the community about the candidates. It's about, you know, if the candidates are walking, you know, there's a candidate that we're going to support. We, we would sometimes go out with that candidate and hit the doors in the community to give the community a broader understanding of the candidate and, and um, their purposes, uh, running and, and stuff as such. 
Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jamal. And I'll just piggyback at, <clears throat> on that for a, for a moment before the uh, conclusion um, to say that we are approaching this from the point of view of the issues, mm -hmm. how people are affected. You can look at um, uh, states uh, like uh, Michigan that uh, had a change in, they, they were able to um, change the gerrymandering mm -hmm. and change the elections. And it has to do with workers' rights mm -hmm. and women's reproductive rights and just about everything else. So <clears throat> Tom is right, we're on the edge of fascism yep. here and we can stop that. And not only stop that, we can turn it around. So uh, as Jamal was saying, yes, uh, voter registration, but we approach it on the issues. And when we're looking at candidates, we're not looking at candidates from a personality perspective or even party, Democrat. We're looking at it from what has that candidate accomplished? What are the issues? You know, what is the program on housing, uh, <clears throat> health care, uh, worker rights, especially if it's in, in your state and it's, it, it's an incumbent that's running? You can break that down and you can break down what the extreme right wing wants to take away and destroy everything that's been built. And you can then get the idea across of what's at stake for all of us. And hey, if we join together, we can we can really not only stop that st that horror, but we can move forward mm -hmm. too. So thank you for raising that. Tom is a fabulous uh, leader and worker uh, here in Connecticut. I have a lot of a lot of um, admiration for. So we want to close it out. Coming back to our party program, which was the um, the substance of the session this morning. And uh, uh, I'd like to read the one paragraph um, from the party program. We've been looking at it the whole time, but sometimes it's nice to read and hear uh, the words and you hear them a little bit differently. Um, building Communist Party Clubs. <clears throat> with strategy, tactics, education, and organization within workplaces and working class neighborhoods. Helps win day-to-day -day struggles. Grassroots Communist Party clubs are vital to bringing the party's vision, strategy, and tactics into local work with masses of working people. Being of the working class and sharing its problems and struggles, the policies of the party are tested and honed and become the property of more and more working people, eventually of millions. This is our program. This is what we strive to accomplish and, uh, and, and embody. Um, we're all at different places. We have different kinds of communities. We have history or we're brand new. Um, it doesn't matter because all together we find from where we are, the next step and the next step to where we need to go. And that's the beautiful thing of collectivity and the beautiful thing of being a part of this wonderful organization, the Communist Party USA. So on behalf of Jamal, I hope you don't mind my speaking for you and me. Um, we want to thank uh, Luke. We want to thank Dee and really a big thanks to Lisa Armstrong for helping us create this PowerPoint program. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you for participating um, today. Uh, and thank you to all of the uh, uh, facilitators and, and assistants and everyone who enabled this uh, national school to uh, be the success uh, that it was. And it was a success because of the time and effort put in by the facilitators of the various classes and the uh, uh, work of the participants to set aside the time needed to to uh, join in. So we have this, this was the National School Part 1. We will have national, uh, the second part of this National School in September. Where we, where we will focus a little bit more on the U.S. working class and uh, its composition and its challenges and its struggles. And, and we hope you will uh, participate again uh, in September and work with us to ensure that as many people as possible uh, have access to the opportunity to join in as well. So thank you all and, Jam and Jamal. 
I'm sorry. Yes, Jamal, your art is a part of the working class movement, the working class struggle, and it's a beautiful representation of our lives. Oh, thank you so much, Dee. I appreciate you. I appreciate you guys dearly. Thank you guys so much, comrades. Thank so, you. So enjoy the rest of your weekend, every everyone, and thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you.